welcome everyone. Um, thanks for joining us today. This is exciting. We've got a really hot topic, um, submetering in buildings metered as part of a campus and the context of compliance with the Clean Buildings Performance Standard. So of course this is uh, forcing a lot of uh, head scratching, I'm sure for many folks in the industry. And luckily we have a stellar lineup of panelists who have a ton of experience in this realm. So I am excited to get into it. My name is Melissa Sokolowski. I'm uh, the senior, proje uh, senior project manager at the Northwest Energy Efficiency Council. Just quickly, we'll give you a little idea of the Northwest Energy Efficiency Council. We're a uh, business association of the energy efficiency and building decarbonation industry. Our mission is to remove all carbon emissions from building energy use. We do that through market-based thought leadership, education, and advocacy, so a lofty goal. and we're in it to win it. So uh, one of our flagship programs, the Smart Building Center, uh, a nonprofit education program. We do, uh, we are a brick and mortar location, uh, an energy efficiency innovation space um, right in the historic Pacific Tower. Can't miss us and uh, driving through Seattle. Really iconic building and a lot of good stuff going on. So. We uh, have training and event spaces. We hold networking events, trainings, classes, webinars like this one. We do demonstrations of smart technology and strategies, uh, data visualizations, and we have a tool lending library of diagnostic and monitoring tools available for free. That's the best part. Uh, local pickup or we can ship them to you. So. Check out our tool lending library, really amazing resource. We also, one of our uh, longest running programs is the building operator certification. I myself am a proud BOC grad. Probably <clears throat> we have a few BOC operators um, here on the call. And uh, we are really uh, filling the gap of uh, meeting um, the needs of the evolving workforce uh, the continuing trend toward uh, sensor-based building automation, smart technologies, um, diversifying skill sets, and operators save their buildings a lot of money. So well worth many times over the cost of enrollment. And I might add that uh, BOC level two can uh, qualify as a that qualified person to submit um, your compliance for the Clean Buildings Performance Standard. So just a little plug for the BOC, great program. And I do want to also note the Smart Building Center recently has set up a Clean Buildings Performance Standard help desk. So we offer one-on-one -on -one uh, consultation during business hours um, and other resources, training videos. I'll leave that up for just another moment if you want to grab that QR, QR code. But that's also available on our website at smartbuildingscenter.org. Really helpful stuff. And I also want to just thank our sponsor, Puget Sound Energy, who has helped make this specific webinar possible, this series of webinars that we've been doing. We did another one recently on commissioning in K through 12 schools. So um, big shout out to Puget Sound Energy. Um, PSE has uh, a lot of really great programs that can help with your compliance. They have a Clean Buildings Accelerator program. They have their Strategic Energy Management program, commissioning incentives, all sorts of good offerings from PSE. So, um, and I know we have a couple of representatives from PSE also on the line. Beth, thank you, Beth Gilbertson. Um, feel free to give her a little note if you'd like. To reach out. We'll also share information, um, contact information near the end of the presentation. Um, I failed to do a little housekeeping. First, wanted to note that we are in webinar only mode. So um, we have our panelists and presenters on sharing their video. You all, the rest of you in the audience, will be um, listening in. 
Uh, I also do have Britton on the uh, behind the scenes helping me out. Thanks, Britton from Smart Building Center. And um, we will, this uh, session is being recorded and we will provide the link to the recording as well as some additional resources. We'll send that, those out to all attendees. So I want to go ahead and introduce our panelists. We have, a, again, a very stellar lineup of folks who know their stuff. So um, we have Julia Weigel from McKinstry. Um, we have Pete Siegel from ATS Automation. We have Andrew Lemberg from uh, Community Colleges of Spokane. We have David Baker from the Washington State Department of Enterprise Services. And we also have Lincoln Ferris from Seattle Central College. So um, really excited and we're gonna have a great discussion. I had a nice session um, with all of these folks the other day and they just have so much to offer and share. So let's get right into it. I'm gonna, the way this will go is um, a few of our panelists have uh, some short presentations queued up to give us kind of a, an information session, some background, and then we will have an opportunity for a Q&A session. So we'll hold most questions toward the end. I might, uh, if there's something really relevant to what one of the presenters is speaking on in the moment, we'll, we can take those questions. Um, but we will have a good chunk of time at the end to address any questions. So let's go ahead and get further into it. Um, first up, I'm going to uh, introduce Julia, I, uh, again, from McKinstry. Uh, we're really lucky to have McKinstry as um, one of our partners, uh, our sponsor partners as well. They're one of the leading mechanical service companies in the region. And Julia specifically knows the clean buildings performance standard inside and out, has a ton of experience consulting on this um, and helping folks with um, solutions for compliance. So. I'll let you take it away, Julia. Thank you for the wonderful intro, Melissa. I'm very happy to be here to talk about clean buildings. Um, feel free to go to the next slide and I can jump in. I wanted to give everyone just some very high level background on clean buildings. I'm sure this is not news to most, but just to set the stage, um, clean buildings is the energy performance standard that Washington State designed for existing buildings and signed into law in 2019. And Washington State is the first state to sign something like this for existing buildings. Since that signing, uh, the law has broken buildings out into two groups. One is one are called tier two buildings, and those are buildings that are 50,000 square feet and larger. And then tier two are 20,000 square feet to 50,000 square feet. All of those buildings, 20,000 square feet and greater, have to be benchmarked in Energy Star, but only the larger buildings, the tier one buildings, actually have to meet an energy use intensity target. Next slide, please. So a rough outlook at what this process can really look like puts us in phase zero of understanding how these buildings need to report and how their metering is set up. I call it phase zero because until you understand this, you can't even dive into the benchmarking part of this process. So this is really the phase where we're having the conversation we're focused on during this webinar, which is the conversation around submetering. Are the meter, uh, are the buildings metered individually or adequately for compliance? And if they're not, what are the next steps that you can take to either meter them adequately or comply without doing that metering? And what are the pros and cons of each of those options? Once you get that straightened out, you can dive into the benchmarking, you can get the building set up in Energy Star and figure out where it's performing and where it needs to go, what its building energy use intensity target is. Once you understand that, you can actually work on planning out how you're going to comply, whether your building is five points above target, 50 points above target, or a few points below. There are a lot of different ways that you can approach compliance. And all of that planning happens in the second phase here. Once all that's done, the third phase is really the project phase. So if coming out of all this planning, your building really needs to get a controls upgrade, for example, or some other sort of project, that happens in the third phase, which is why the timeline is all over the place, really building dependent and scenario dependent. And once all that's done, and in addition, an energy management plan and an operations and maintenance program are developed for each building or for a portfolio, then you can actually submit for compliance. 
So there are a number of steps that have to be taken before actually getting to compliance. And each of those requires enough time to work through them and gather the right amount of data. Next slide, please. Thank you. So I love visualizing this on a timeline, especially because we're talking about so many different things that need to be completed. So the Department of Commerce opened this program up in October of 2021. That's when notification letters were sent out to owners, which some of you may have received, some still may not have. Um, but those came out in October, and that's also when the Early Adopter Incentive Program opened up. So we're sort of a, a year and a quarter since then into this process and still a few years away from compliance. If you start now, you still have to take that time to benchmark, gather the right data, calculate a building EUI and a target. And then once you figure out how far off target you are, you still need time to be able to budget for any potential work and finance that work and actually implement the projects, um, considering as well what's going on in the industry from a supply chain standpoint um, and a work availability standpoint. So there are a lot of steps that have to be taken to get to those dates. The dates on the top right of this timeline are the actual compliance dates for these various buildings. The dates on the bottom are the last possible date you really wanna be collecting your EUI data because it takes 12 months to calculate an EUI. And just for full clarity, EUI energy use intensity is calculated as energy over square footage. So it normalizes energy consumption over space. So you can compare a 20,000 square foot building to a 100,000 square foot building. And that's the metric that Clean Buildings is tracking. So when you look at this timeline, you realize there's actually not that much time to get all of these different aspects done. So if nothing else, I do recommend starting with the benchmarking and planning process now because it's the lightest lift and it is the most important piece that informs how big of an effort this is really going to be. Next slide, please. So here are the big bucket options for compliance. There is the first option, which is I would consider standard compliance. That is starting from wherever your building is performing at and getting it to meet the EUI target that is calculated specifically for that building. So when do you do this? You do this when a building currently has an EUI and it can also have its target calculated. So that implies that the building is metered adequately. Um, this also implies that the building is able to reduce its EUI gap and get to the target. The second compliance path here is called the investment criteria. That's the alternative compliance path built into clean buildings. So when do you do this? You do the investment criteria path when a building has a target, but is unable to reach it. Say the building is 100 plus points over its target and there are no cost effective measures that can get them there. You might pursue investment criteria. Um, you might pursue investment criteria if there's no target designed for your space use type, like data centers do not have a target specifically designed for them. Um, and you also might have to pursue investment criteria path if your building just is not metered adequately. So if you have, um, if you have a laboratory on site, uh, there is a target for that, but if it's not metered adequately, unless you choose to meter it, you would have to pursue the investment criteria path. And in order to do that, the way that's done is you conduct an ASHRAE level two audit, and then you conduct a life cycle cost analysis of all of the energy efficiency measures that come out of that audit. And then you implement the cost effective measures and that gets reported to commerce. And that gets done every five year cycle for compliance. Now the third path for complying here is meeting the target without adequate metering. So in this situation, when you're evaluating your portfolio and looking at what you have and how things are metered, you might find that that laboratory on your campus is not adequately metered. Instead of pursuing investment criteria, you might make the choice to sub-meter that building and get the specific UI data for that building. In that case, once you wait 12 months from installing metering to get that data, you can then pursue the standard compliance path of meeting the target. The final option is non-compliance. The final option for this is choosing not to comply at all and paying the penalty that is associated with this. Um, 
This is typically not a recommended path because this this penalty will be um, will be issued every five year cycle. And for uh, for calculating that, the penalty is a five thousand dollar administration fee plus one dollar a square foot per year, uh, administered up to eighteen months. So very rough math. It's about a dollar and a half per square foot as the max penalty per cycle. So what we're going to be talking through in this webinar is submetering, which brings you back to the option of complying through the standard compliance path, which is more of a permanent compliance, because once you have access to your building energy consumption, you can track it against the target and you can bring it below target and then you can manage it longer term to keep it there. Next slide, please. So here is a uh, very rough cartoon example of a campus. So. In this situation, this campus has three buildings in the tier one category. So they're all over 50,000 square feet. And there is one building in the tier two category at 20,000 square feet. And this campus has one natural gas meter and one electric meter. This probably sounds like a familiar situation to a number of people on this call. And this particular campus, the way it stands has two options to comply if we don't consider the non-compliance route. There is the investment criteria path of conducting an ASHRAE level two audit on all of the tier one buildings, evaluating um, all of the energy efficiency measures with a, like, through a life cycle cost analysis, and then implementing all cost effective measures. And then every five years, that same path has to be, or that same process has to be uh, conducted. The other option for this campus is to submeter the appropriate buildings and then comply by meeting the target long-term. Uh, next slide, please. I think that's, that's it. Oh, there should be one more. Is there one more? Hmm. There should be. Let's see. Give me just one moment. And if not, I can talk through the next one. Just let me. I'll know. just have you. I'll have you, have you talk through it. Yeah. Awesome. Must so have that one somehow. No worries. The last slide looks the same, but I've listed out pros and cons of going down the submetering path. So, let's talk about the cons first. If you choose in this situation to submeter these individual buildings, so you can get building specific energy consumption data, it does take twelve months to calculate an EUI. So. Once you install those meters, from the time you install the meters and get everything up and running and get data flowing properly, it will take 12 months to get your initial EUI. So you do have to wait that amount of time then to really do the benchmarking and understand how far off target that building is. So there is, there is a time concern with that piece. Um, the other component is, of course, you do then have to invest in installing the meter and setting up whatever um, physical components, you know, hardware or software have to be installed to get this up and running. Um, the third piece to having some meters installed that I put in the con list is the longer term maintenance of these meters. Um, a lot of us are used to having utility meters and those are maintained by the utility. And if you install a sub meter, the onus is now on the building owner or facility managers, what have you, to be monitoring that meter and making sure that it is adequately reporting and reading and just running properly. If you do uh, some sort of energy management program, it's a little bit easier to throw that in as a component that gets checked on regularly. So those were the cons. Now let's talk quickly about the pros to going down the submetering path here. One is that you get a lot more insight into the performance of your building specifically. You get regular consumption data for that specific facility that's not amalgamated amongst a number of buildings. So if you have one high performer and one low performer, you can now monitor that. Um, this really supports any longer term decarbonization planning you might have with your organization. Um, it gives you the ability to track this long term and adjust and tweak your energy consumption and your building performance um, much more delicately because you have that insight. It also gives you access to tracking your greenhouse gas emissions, which um, in the city of Seattle is going to be regulated very soon. And even if it's not going to be regulated again, that does contribute to people's decarbonization and other organizational goals. 
Um, another component of this is once you submeter, it actually gives your building access to the early adopter in, um, early adopter incentive funds, of which most are still available, by the way. So uh, you cannot apply for that if you don't have individual building metering because you are not able to meet a target without that. So those are all a lot of pros. And then in addition, you don't have to continue to re-audit the building every five years just to comply, which is the case if you have the investment criteria. So it really puts the bulk of the effort on this first compliance cycle of understanding the energy consumption and bringing it down to target. Longer term, you're really just focused on managing that energy consumption and keeping it there. And some metering allows you to do that. So those are the biggest pros and cons to going down this path of deciding to submeter instead of sticking with this singular meter, meter situation. I will hand this off to Pete. Okay, yeah, thank you, Julia, so much. Um, and we will make sure to get that slide put back in. We'll send out the, a PDF of the slide slideshow itself um, so that you all have, have that to reference. Sorry about that. Um, what I'm hearing is get started like yesterday, or if you haven't already, there's a lot to do here. But what I'm also um, understanding is that there is help. There's help from folks like McKinstry, Juliet McKinstry. They have um, a lot of very qualified people to help you with this. We also have help from utilities. We have help from the Department of Commerce. We'll get into a little more of those resources um, further down. Uh, we also have one question I just want to make sure um, we uh, we will answer, we'll get to this, the cost range. Of course, that's what everyone is curious about. What is the cost range um, estimate for, for electric meter installation? So we'll, of course, every situation is different, but we'll um, uh, be touching on that further on in the presentations. So um, thanks again, Julia. I'll go ahead and introduce Pete Siegel, who is with ATS Automation, uh, Energy Services Manager. He's also a certified energy manager, a certified demand side manager. So um, lots of skill there, lots of credentials, lots of letters behind his name. And um, ATS, I also wanna mention, is a leader in building automation, smart technology integration, um, they have been a big supporter of uh, Smart Building Center over the years, and we have a great partnership as well. So um, I will go ahead and turn the time over to Pete. Thank you, Pete. I know you've got a lot of great knowledge and information and experience to share. Well, thank you, Melissa. And uh, one other thing I'm just going to point out, I am a NEEC board member, so I do have an association with NEEC as well. Um, a lot of you know ATS as a, you know, our, our core business. We're a building automation, energy management control system contractor, system integrator, and control service provider. Uh, I manage our uh, energy team, which provides ESCO services and ongoing building performance services through our data and analytics software platforms. But one of the other things that my team does is we get involved with our core uh, controls construction and service teams when it comes to metering. And due to Washington State Energy Code, Seattle Energy Code, submetering has grown exponentially in the last five, 10 years. Uh, we have buildings in, Seattle's, in Seattle and more than just one or two that have over 1,100 submeters. I don't, I don't know if I would necessarily recommend deploying submeters like that for a litany of reasons, um, but that's a topic for another day. Today, we're talking about metering on campuses. So if you go to the next slide, and I'm gonna, I'm gonna like, Put my finger up something like that, Melissa, so you know I don't have to keep on saying that. Um, but so, uh, so today I'm going to be discussing in, in a really quickly and very bridged, a bridged, a high level look at you know the different phases of deploying uh, submetering on campus and some of the challenges and issues that arise that I've seen over the past. And I, I think I did my first campus submetering project over a decade ago. Um, and we still see challenges every day. We run into new ones. So I'm going to talk about planning, installation, and data analysis. So, uh, oh, planning stage. Well, that showed up kind of weird. Uh, what, where, and how. Um, so the what. Go ahead, Melissa. We have to think about what are you metering? 
and what data is needed. And, and when you think about the clean building standard, the simplest way to think about what you're metering, metering is if you draw like a box around your building and you identify all the energy sources that are going into the building. And uh, earlier, I think there was some question about, oh, what, what's the cost of electric meter? Well, it's not just electric submeters. You may have electric, you may have gas, you may have steam, you have, may have hot and chilled water. So you have to think about all your energy sources. And then the other thing you need to think about is what data is needed. Because we're talking about the clean building standard, the only thing truly you need is consumption. However, you're, if you're gonna be investing in these meters, there's so much more information that you can pull out of these meters. So during your planning stage, you should identify what's the other information you wanna pull out of these meters. So where? When we're talking about where, I, I like to think about is physically where are we, um, where is it the, the meter need to be installed in service? Is it a single location? I have been on several uh, campuses where there's buildings that actually are fed by multiple sources. And then you have to put in multiple meters. So that's something you need to think about. Um, and then not only do you have to think about those multiple meters, but how are you going to create a virtual meter, what I call meter map, um, to account for these multiple feeds and add them together. I've also been done work on campuses where because one building was fed from another, they didn't meter each of the buildings. They used meter math, said building A plus building C minus building D gives us building E. So I've seen people value engineering out meters um, to save some money. I don't necessarily recommend that, but that's something to think about. Again, going to where you're servicing meter. And then accessibility is important. Sometimes you may have to put, a, we had to put a meter out in like a service yard, but there was no pathway to get communication. So we had to do a wireless uh, setup. So uh, access and accessibility is important as well. And then how are you going to collect the data? Are you gonna use your existing building automation or energy management system? Are you going to use an internet um, uh, enabled meter that actually hosts its own web pages? So you need to get it to the internet. Are you gonna, to, to do that, are you gonna leverage the campus network? If you're gonna leverage the campus network, you now need to get IT involved. What happens if they make a change? I've seen that happen where they change uh, the structure and then all of a sudden all the meters go down. So these are things you need to think about. You also need to think about the protocols. Are you gonna use BACnet because you're gonna use your building automation system or Modbus? Uh, are you gonna use an open API because it's a web interface? What if it's an old type of meter that's just a pulser, just makes a pulse every, you know, every uh, 10 CFM or something like that? Um, how are you going to collect the, that data? So you need to think about those things. Um, and then the last thing you need to think about is um, how you're going to organize, align, normalize, and visualize the data. And what I mean by that is data may not all come in in the exact same time period. Typically, we use 15-minute intervals for energy. So how are you going to align that data? How are you going to get normalize it at the same time period? How are you going to visualize it? You know, building automation systems and energy, manage, uh, energy management systems, I have yet to see one. And, and this is coming from someone who we, this is our core business. I have yet to see one that does a really good job of aligning data and visualizing data for meters. They do a great job of trending the data, but that's about it. Uh, some meters have their own metering software that can be used. Um, that may be an option. Uh, the option that many people have gone, and in, including um, Andrew's going to talk about, they went with a third-party EIS, which I call, use the term for an energy information system, or an analytic software package. And that's what we tend to use as well. But uh, Andrew's going to talk a little bit more about that later. Next slide, please. When we're talking about um, installation, what you need to think about is shutdowns. Uh, Julia spent a bit of time talking about, uh, you know, the schedule and how quickly you need to get this done. But shutdowns, it's a variable that may be difficult to install some of these meters. Do you need to shut down the entire building? What does that mean? Most people on this call, I presume, are, are a lot of them are college campuses. And some campuses have, you know, experiments that are going on. And it's hard to get an electric shut down to the building. So part of the planning stage, you have to think about that. What's gonna to happen to the building if you have to shut down your hot water or chilled water service because you have to install, uh, you, don't, you can't isolate it. You need to install a meter or a flow meter. What happens if you cut off gas service, steam service? Things you need to think about during the install and planning phase. The next thing you need to think about is data integration. Do you have the correct data points that you're bringing in? I have seen so many projects where the uh, integration person thought they were bringing in uh, the, uh, consumption, but they're actually bringing in apparent energy, the difference between KWH and KVAR. 
Uh, they thought they're bringing in uh, power, but they're actually bringing in demand. Interestingly enough, they have the both, both or KW. Uh, or they thought they're bringing in total power, but they're only bringing a single base. So you need to think about making sure you have the correct data points. Then you also have to think about if you need to do meter map, where does that meter map occur? Does it occur at a programmatic level, programming in whatever system you're using, or are you going to manually do it? Also, this information needs to get to portfolio manager. Are you going to do that automatically and have the system somehow report up to portfolio manager? Or are you going to do that manually? So some of the integration things you need to think about. Also, you need to think about meter commissioning, and this is a huge bugaboo. I kind of mentioned uh, some buildings where we've had lots and lots of uh, um, meters on site. And the problem is with commissioning and, and actually just the general operation is you tend to have contractor A provides the meter, contractor B installs the meter, contractor C integrates to the meter. When there's a problem with data, there's always this finger pointing, who's responsible for what? So that's something you need to think about, especially in commissioning can help with that. And so some of the commissioning issues that I've seen, location, is the meter actually physically in the wrong location? I've seen panels that are labeled wrong, and so they got installed on the wrong panel, or it got installed uh, just incorrectly to begin with. An interesting one recently on a campus, we were doing a um, BTU metering for chilled water. The BTU meter was actually on the plant side of the bypass valve. It got installed, this was an existing meter that was just installed in the wrong place. And what happened is even if the bypass valve is fully bypassing all the water to that building, you know, the, you're looking at delta T and flow. The delta T may have been really small, but it was really heavy flow. So it looked like this building was using all sorts of consumption, but it wasn't, it was bypassing. So location matters. And then proper meter setup. I've seen so many meters that were set up either with the wrong values or, you know, it was using the wrong meter for the wrong application. Um, also, you have things you have to think about just in general about meter setup and, and insulation is, are the, is the CT sized right? Is it installed right? Are the voltage and the CT leads on the same phases? If you have to do BTU meter, do you have enough up and downstream um, pipe diameters for proper reading? So it's really important. And then the, the last thing too, or the, one of the things as far as the information flow is making sure you do that end-to-end -end data verification from the meter to the EIS or the building automation system or whatever you're using, making sure that the data at the meter matches the data on the screen. And that's one of the reasons why I really like to use meters that have uh, visual displays on them. It just makes it much easier for verification and also troubleshooting. And then the last piece, which is one of the most challenging pieces is, is the data right? This is not a temperature sensor, a thermostat that sits on the wall. You can't just take your, uh, your, your handheld you know, thermostat or uh, uh, temperature sensor and go 72 degrees, 72.1 degrees, close enough, we're good. It is really difficult to make sure that th these meters, to figure out if they're accurate. There's different things you can do. There's ways you can do it. It's difficult. Um, but the most important thing to make sure is you get the meters that you know, are, are factor calibrated and you do proper install then you can feel pretty good about that. Next slide, please. So the data analysis, that's another important piece. And what it, uh, for data analysis, um, you have to think about who is going to be looking at the data. We have done projects where customers have spent thousands and thousands of dollars, tens of thousands installing meters, and they don't do anything with it um, because they never had a champion. So you need a champion who's gonna look at this, uh, this information on a regular basis. They have to look for data quality issues. They have to look for problems. And um, that same champion can also be the person to figure out how they wanna use the data. You don't wanna just use this data just for clean building performance standard. If you're doing that, that's the bare minimum. What you should really be using it for is trying to identify means for better building performance. So much information can be gained uh, by looking at interval data in a meter. Um, you can tell if the building ran when it shouldn't have run. You can tell if it started too early or uh, ran too late. Uh, you can go to the next bullet point there. That'd be great, Melissa. Um, the other thing you want to really use that data for, it's just identifying opportunities and outliers. Um, it's just meter data provides a wealth of information. And the last thing you need to think about, and uh, Julia kind of hit on this, is maintenance. Um, I don't know why, but meters go offline all the time. Uh, they may lose communication. It could be because IT made a change, or I've seen it where meters are physically, the wires get cut the communication line. For any number of reasons, meters may go offline. Or I've seen cases where the electrical distribution changed. 
And then all of a sudden, you can go to the next bullet point, by the way, Melissa. Um, the electrical distribution layout changed. And what we once thought this meter A was only monitoring one building, they added another building off of it. So this maintenance, you constantly need to make sure you're make, uh, that the information is correct um, because you will get data anomalies. It, it's inevitable. I've yet to be on a project where you can just install a meter, especially if you're doing meter math and you walk away. Next slide, please. Um, some of the uh, common issues and challenges we run into is data quality in general, and if you're having to do meter math. And some of the things you need to figure out is, what happens if a meter rolls over? What happens if it's at 990,000 kWh in one time period, and then the next time period, because meters consumption just goes up, the next time period, it's 10 kWh. Meter rolled over, how do you account for that? Most systems can account for that, but I've seen systems that don't account for that. Another question, what happens if the meter rolls backwards, even for a single time period? I don't know why, but we have, a, have a, had meters go backwards for one time period, 15, or 15 minutes or sometimes an hour, and then they pick back up. Um, not sure what the issue is, but when that happens, some systems may look at that as a meter rollover because it went backwards and it wasn't a bi-directional meter, uh, meter. So it may actually double up on consumption. You will have the spike of consumption that's false. Other thing to think about, what happens if the meter stops communicating? And that particular meter is being used for meter math because maybe you need two meters to come up with the total building. And what happens if it stops communicating? And what happens if it returns from communication? Was it collecting data that whole time or was it offline? So that can really impact some of your meter math over time. So really what I'm trying to get at here is, and this is just from experience, is that you need to, you need to be able to what I call clean the data because you will get bad pieces of data every now and then and what you need to be able to, you know, uh, clean it up because it truly wasn't a rollover or maybe it truly was a rollover or the meter stopped communicating. Um, so that's been really important for us in the lesson learned. Uh, you can go to the next bullet point. And then some of the issues that we see almost over and over again, these, this may be a top, I don't know what it is, seven or eight. Um, CT voltage, uh, the CTs and the voltage reference, references are not aligned. CTs are on A, the voltage reference is on B. Uh, what you'll see, you'll see a low power factor uh, typically, but that happens more often than I like to uh, say it does. Um, I've seen the CTs are oversized. This really comes into play when you're monitoring mechanical loads sometimes, and the mechanical panel was set for you know full load, but it's nighttime and you only have one piece of equipment running and the CT is so oversized, it can't even get a reading there. That can happen on a building as well. And so when the building is barely operating, it may not be picking up on the, uh, the consumption. Uh, I kind of already mentioned meters going offline for long periods of time. How does that impact the data? Especially if you need that data to calculate your EUI, which is why it's so important to have a champion to be reviewing all that data, at least on a regular basis to make sure things are still online. Um, the one line diagram is incorrect. Uh, that's happened before. We thought we captured all the loads in the building, but we found out they scabbed some power from somewhere for an uh, electric vehicle charger because it was easy to grab it from somewhere. So making sure the one line diagrams are correct to make sure you don't miss any loads and your, or whatever meter math is correct. Um, this is an interesting one. What happens if the sum of all your campus submeters don't align with your utility bill? What do you do now? Is it the utility that's off? Is it one of your 10, 20, 15, 15 submeters are off? How do you rec uh, reconcile that? And that's a challenging one. I see pulse factors that are off. We think every pulse is 10 cubic feet, but it's actually 100 or vice versa or something like that. I've seen incorrect units. Uh, we thought we were um, uh, the meter was in KWH, but it was megawatts instead or something like that. So these are very common issues that tend to resurface uh, a lot. Um, and uh, just one last thing, and I'm just gonna be really quick about this. This is a real life scenario on a campus where this is how the metering got set up. And you notice they acted, we, building D was uh, fed off building C. So we had to, you know, we had to do some meter math. Building G had multiple meters, but then what happened and go ahead and click the, the next button there. Um, I just go all the way through, sorry. And one more, building H was added and, uh, and then all of a sudden, building C looked like, oh my goodness, the load almost doubled. What happened? And it was like that for years. And then we found out later on, like, oh, we building H was fed off the building C. It's like, well, that's important to know. 
So that's some of the challenges that we've seen and things to think about for metering. Thanks. Wow, thanks, Pete. Uh, what a breadth of knowledge you have to share and from experience, and I'm sure a lot of headaches and um, head scratching. So um, really, <laughs> really valuable. Uh, it's probably a little overwhelming to hear all of this stuff that can go wrong, but valuable to understand all the things that need to be paid attention to. So again, there is help out there um, in the form of the ATSs and the McKinstries and other professionals in this industry that can help. So thank you. And looks like I have located your missing slide, Julia. I don't know, things happen. Something gets a little uh, out of line, so I apologize there. Um, we're going to go ahead and uh, move along. I think I have a, uh, yeah, we'll go ahead and move on. I'm going to go ahead and introduce Andrew Lemberg. Um, Andrew is a resource conservation manager at um, Spokane uh, Community Colleges of Spokane and has been through this process, been down this road, and has seen a successful implementation. So. Uh, we're going to hear from Andrew about some of the scenarios that he's had to navigate and how they dealt with that and some of the decision-making factors. Um, really excited to hear from you, and I'll let you take it away, Andrew. Yeah, thanks, Melissa. Um, I'm Andrew Lemberg, Lead Resource Conservation for the Community Colleges of Spokane. Uh, just a quick overview so you can understand what comprises what, what the area that I work on comprises. We're two main campuses. Spokane Falls Community Colleges and Spokane Community College, um, both located in the city of Spokane. Total, total square footage is about 2.1 million square feet. We've got a little over 50 total buildings between the two campuses. And of those, 17 buildings are sized over 50,000 square feet. So they're within that tier one category. We've got a handful more that are in the uh, tier two category. We haven't yet attacked that, but we can all talk about that in a little bit. Uh, none of the none of the 17 buildings on the main campuses were submetered to start. So I think a lot of people that are on this call probably relate to that. They're probably in a similar situation if you're in a municipality or if you're on a um, public campus. I was added to the team in 2018, primarily to address things like greenhouse gas emissions. We're a mandatory reporter because we're such a large district. Every year I have to report our greenhouse gas emissions to the state of Washington. Um, I do sustainability and all obviously resource conservation projects. And then um, it's my duty to keep people within our leadership group informed about legislation that will affect the district coming up or is currently affecting the district, like Clean Buildings Act. Uh, last year, almost exactly a year ago, we added a second RCM to kind of keep sustainability and conservation at the highest priority at the forefront of what we're doing so that we're not staying behind because I think everybody's well aware at the state level, these regulations, uh, these hurdles that we have to go through, they're starting to build and they're getting a little bit more complicated, um, a little bit more in depth, and we realize that we need maybe more than just myself to address that and get a strategy and a plan going forward. Uh, next slide, please, Melissa. Okay, so on to the practical side of it, the submetering project itself. The first question that we asked ourselves was, how can the district comply with the clean building law as efficiently and effectively as possible, which is what you're all asking, right? And so some of the initial questions that came up were, hey, would this be an internal or external contracted out project? And I think that we stopped right there. That was the very beginning, the initial question where we stopped and said, hmm, how are we going to approach this? We, seven or eight years ago, we tried to submeter watering on many of our, of our largest buildings on both campuses. And for a variety of reasons, and that was with our internal crews, for a variety of reasons, that really wasn't that successful. And actually, Pete was talking about um, some of the challenges in his presentation and they actually kind of overlap. So there were improper pulse factors. Uh, the meters were sized incorrectly. CTs weren't sized, correct, in, were sized incorrectly. And so it didn't really work out. In fact, it was kind of a huge failure. So we took that knowledge and we said, mm, 
I think we're a little bit more comfortable having this externally contracted out. Uh, the stakeholders can give us, can be, you know, we're the stakeholders, the people that are the contractors can have the engineers involved, the architects, the designers, the software people, and they can give us a presented package in an efficient way. And we can make, you know, some pretty good estimates or solutions based off of that. So after that, once we decided we were going to go the external route, we started to look with these contractors on what that consisted of within our campuses. So we've got a main electric meter for each campus, just one, and we have a main natural gas meter for each campus as well. So just like Julia and Pete were saying, we had to submeter these 17 buildings individually. So we had to get the sizing correctly. We had to make sure that we were dealing with the correct kind of voltage. So there's three phase in all these buildings. Some of them are 480 volts. Some of them are 277 volts. There's a whole slew of issues with that that we had to work out. We had to identify the piping, the conduit, and any other infra infrastructure uh, considerations that came up. So a big one for us was data. Where was the data, where was the existing data located? And how would we get data to these meters? Um, and so that we had to work through that. What we ended up going with was down below, you can kind of see are these Elster uh, gas meters made by Honeywell and they have different sizes. And we basically use four different sizes. Uh, rotary meter, super basic, uh, really a simple kind of your Honda or Toyota of the gas meter world. Similar situation was with the electrical submittal. We went with the Power Scout 24 HD, also a Power Scout 12 HD. That has really been um, a solid backbone for us to get our information from. So that's what we decided on with the submittals. This wasn't just like a couple week process. This took multiple months of going through and kind of combing through the information within our buildings. So cost review, I know some of you have already jumped down to the bottom and said, holy cow, cost per building? We'll get to that in a second. Before that, we went um, and we, we decided if we're gonna, going to externally contract this out, how would we do that? We happened to have an existing ESCO project um, that was uh, uh, improving our transformers on both campuses. And so what we decided to do was piggyback onto that to kind of save some funds on the DES side of things and to also speed the process up. So we piggybacked onto that ESCO project that was upgrading transformers and went with that. At the end of the day, the cost per building averaged $30,000. And before you just say, oh, that's what it's gonna cost for me, that's a huge range. We have um, one of our buildings in the first slide, building one old main is almost 250,000 square feet. That has four different electrical meters and two different natural gas meters. Conversely, we've got another building, building five on the other campus that has one electric meter, one gas meter, that costs far less. That was something like 10 or 11,000. So that was the average cost of all 17 of those buildings. But that's what it cost us. Uh, next slide, please. The next thing that we wanted to decide was the software consideration. And Pete talked a lot about this. I won't dive too deep into it because he covered it really well. But the thing you just need to ask yourself is, do you even need it? Do I have one municipal building or one or two campus buildings that are going to fall under tier one or tier two. Well, maybe you don't need it. Maybe you can just go once a month and check your rotary numbers on your gas and you can check the backbone integration on Power Scout. You can see the number and you can manually input it and send it into portfolio manager. And if you can do that, great. That is not something we can do. Uh, we're far too big of a, of, of a district and two campuses that there's no way that that could have even been a consideration for us. So we said yes to software, yes to data. Um, and then we asked ourselves, how will it integrate? We have four different HVAC dashboards, mostly through BACnet, but also through other different protocols. And within that, we asked ourselves, do we want to integrate that within our standalone HVAC system, or do we want that to be on its own platform? Ultimately, we decided to have its own platform within its own server. And that's a good decision for us because it kind of unmuddies the water within our HVAC dashboard. But the considerations you have to keep in mind are we had to integrate and involve IT at every step of the way within this process. So it was multiple months of, of kind of talking through the plan and the, and the strategy with IT and getting them to buy off on what we're trying to accomplish. And also getting them to buy off on the fact that they'll have to do a little bit of maintenance on the server going forward 
it's not just facilities and the facilities division that's going to have to you know, do ongoing maintenance on these meters, but also IT will as well. So you have to consider that. So ultimately we chose SkySpark via ATS. Don't worry, I'm not an ATS like sales rep. I just met Pete two days ago. So th there's no like conflict of interest there, but we decided to go with SkySpark. And, um, and I wanna show you why, because it's been a great product for us. So I'm gonna share the screen and I'll do a real quick tutorial about what I do. Hopefully you can see that. So here's my main screen on SkySpark. And there's a whole bunch of things that I can do here. I can, I can monitor my meters, I can get utility billing, I can get current energy. But right now I'm just gonna go in the historian. And from here, I can select which campus I'm using. And I'm going to select, uh, I'll do SCC. We'll do building nine. We'll start with gas meters so you can see that. I add that. Maybe we'll do 27. I add that, I click OK. And now you can see just today what our consumption is. And I can hide one building if it's getting too muddy. I can show the other building. But more importantly, let me take a snapshot of maybe the last month. And then let's start to compare. And here you can see some interesting trends. And I'll actually clean this up a little bit. The thing that you like to see is on the weekends, these buildings are basically empty and shut down. And you can kind of see down here, that's what they're doing. Sunday uh, on the 29th, it started to build up. And I'll tell you why. Because in Spokane, it got really cold. So you can pull weather trend off of that. And I'll just do temperature. But you can do, obviously, humidity and condition as well. And you can trend that against that. So you can see what the average temperature is. It's cold over here, and it got really cold down to seven degrees, it looks like. And as that temperature dropped, you can see the gas meter start to go up. So there's a whole bunch of great data you can use from that. I'm gonna go back. I'll show you real quick the electrical side of things. I'll do... Again, we'll just grab building six, maybe an electrical meter, and what the hell, we'll do 27 again, and show you the electrical portions. This I really like because it'll show you the power factor, which is incredibly important. And you can see some, a little bit of concerning trends down here with the, with the power factor dipping to 0.83 or lower. You can also get energy, which is different than power. Um, I won't go into that, but hopefully you know the difference. And then again, you can trend them off of each other. So there's just a lot of important little data points that feed so much insight into what I do every day. I'm going to show you one last thing so I don't take up too much time. And that is the utility billing, which we are in process of actually getting an automatic notification correlated with cost. So let's do, I don't know, building five. And I'm just going to download it because it's easier to see for you guys. Okay. Okay. So what this does is it gives us a snapshot since this went into commission, which was August, the end of August. I can't zoom in on that for some reason but you can see on the electrical meter usage you can see the trend line going up as one would expect for winter time and it's starting to taper off as it's gotten a little bit milder over the last month or so conversely you can see the power quite a bit of power bandwidth that would make me want to look at that a little bit more and see what is exactly going on there and why we're getting such wild swings and then at the bottom here you have um electrical meter usage. So same kind of thing. So I'm going to stop sharing. Okay. And back. Okay, do you have power, uh, Melissa? Are you good? Because I'm not seeing it on my end. Let me just try and reshare then. I'm seeing it, but. Um... That's that's fine. I can just go, if you're on the post installation um, slide. Yep, here we go. Here we okay. go. All right. How's that? Perfect. Good. Looks great. 
Okay, okay. so post installation and and uh, Julia actually did a really good job of explaining the phases. We're basically done with phase zero. So that's not exactly a long ways down this list. We're in phase one land. So we're test we already tested and reviewed SkySpark. SkySpark is working really well. And now we're in the process of setting up Energy Star Portfolio Manager, um, a very manual process. It was set up 15 years ago incorrectly. So we basically had to scrap the entire thing and input all new data. A little bit cumbersome, but we're getting there. We're also tracking and benchmarking. As you can see, we got some of these up in late August. Most of them came in within September and October though. And then we're in the process also of developing an energy management plan. And we already have a pretty good O&M plan in place. So that's kind of where we stand um, in phase one, right in the middle of it. We're also trying to identify how to approach the energy manager, qualified person and qualified energy auditor position. And right now it looks like the plan that we're going with is we'll probably contract those positions out. And the reason being is I'm not an engineer um, and I don't have my BOC level two certification. And we think that there, it's probably just going to be a little bit more simple for us, even though we're a large campus, to have that be taken care of by outside representatives, you know, like a McKinstry or, or, a, or, uh, or any one of the multiple contractors out there that can provide that service. So that's kind of our game plan. Um, I wanna also end this by saying the first day that we had SkySpark, we immediately identified an issue in a building. Like our, our trending data live from that morning showed us that we had a hammering effect in one of our buildings as far as electrical consumption. We've now fixed that 80, 85% of that is totally fixed. We're saving probably between $1,500 and $2,000 a month on, elect on electrical charges that we're not you know, experiencing now on the campus for that building. So this is, yes, while we're doing this for the legislation and we're trying to comply with this law, at the end of the day, the money that we're going to save is going to be vast. It already is, it's already paying for itself slowly. So. Um, I would just encourage people to not look at it in a cumbersome and, um, you know, a state mandated way. This will give you much better building performance over the long term. And you're going to want to, you're, you're going to want to just grab it with open arms and run with it. So all in there. Wow. Great. Thank you so much, Andrew. That was uh, fascinating to see the live demonstration and the power that you have at your fingertips with that system. Um, it's helpful to really visualize it in action. And uh, I really appreciate the way you framed this as, you know, yes, this is, it feels like a very onerous mandate. Um, it's given a lot of headaches for a lot of institutions and organizations. And this can also be an opportunity, um, a long-term strategy toward improved building performance. Julia also touched on, you know, greenhouse gas emissions, um, decarbonization initiatives. So this is, you know, why this law was written in the first place. Um, so I think that's uh, a, a good point. And I I'd like to get into that a little more on, on um, kind of how we can leverage this mandate to multiple benefits. Um, but first I wanna give a chance to um, David, our last presenter, and then we'll get into the Q&A um, uh, portion, but David, so we've heard from, you know, McKinstry and ATS who have, you know, performed these installations, help people figure out how to do this. We've heard from Andrew, who has been through a full implementation. Um, we're going to hear from David now, who is a little further uh, earlier in the process. And I think really valuable to hear about his um, process so far and how um, you, what he's learned along the way and the approach that they're taking. So I'm going to go ahead and um, introduce you to David Baker, who's a resource conservation planner for the Washington State Department of Enterprise Services. And I'll just go ahead and let you take it away, David. Thank you very much. Uh, I have a lot of ground to cover, but a lot of it's already been addressed. So uh, as Melissa said, I'm gonna take you a step back to very early in the process. Uh, next slide, please. We started looking for the Capitol campus at this clean buildings thing. And I joined in October 
And so we're all pretty new in terms of who's doing what with this project. So the first thing we did was looked at what we were gonna need. And then we decided we needed to figure out what it is that we have. So how are we gonna, you know, what are we starting with kind of thing? And so we had go through a couple of basic steps to get together a simple team. Next slide. So our um, first steps were, as I said, just trying to figure out which way is up. What do we have to work with? Um, do we have any um, money for any of this kind of stuff? And then we explored the energy saving uh, performance contracting within our own agency. This is a program that we run. and It's been alluded to, and we can talk about more uh, if we have time later. But um, the first thing, as was noted, uh, there's sort of the budget question. How much money are we talking about here? So I just wanted to mention that uh, my initial budget here was $50,000, did not have that much money. I did not have any reason to pick that much money. What I decided was we had about 20 buildings, maybe it's $1,000 for an electric meter, so that's $20,000, maybe another thousand for another gas meter. So that's $40,000 at a contingency, $50,000. This is not a good number to work with, as we've heard, that's completely inaccurate but it's a starting place. And the big thing I wanna push on this is when you get started on this, you have to just get started. You don't have all the answers. There's a lot of information out there. There's a lot of resources that can help you. You just gotta start somewhere and let your folks know we're starting here. We're gonna revise this. We'll get better detail as we go forward, but here's where we are today. Next slide, please. So this is an overview of our campus, State Capitol Campus in Olympia. What you see on the, um, is a bunch of stripes, lines, pipes, whatever you wanna call them. Uh, all the way on the left is the powerhouse. And 1920, we built the powerhouse, uh, burned some coal, generate electricity and steam heat, uh, upgraded that to uh, oil, and then added chilled water, uh, stopped making electricity. And uh, <clears throat> electricity now comes from a substation, which is all the way on the right-hand side of this image uh, from Puget Sound Energy. And what you see here and what I wanna highlight is that we have a lot of different buildings, different sizes, mostly office, and they have different level of service for each of the buildings, depending on where they're located, when they were built, et cetera. Um, the powerhouse, as I mentioned, is all the way on the left. And you'll see that there are more stripes connected to that. And that's because that was really the original campus, what we call West Campus, left side of the map. And <clears throat> so that's get the, the chilled waters over there. We drag the lines over for steam, but we don't have chilled water on the other side of the campus. It's inconsistent. And as was alluded to, you got a lot of different buildings. You got a lot of different stuff set up. Next slide, please. And so we started to go through here and count out where do we have meters? This is a terrible diagram. It's very busy. It's very distracting, but you'll end up doing an exercise like this. Next slide, please. And then you'll have to take that information and put it into a format that other people can actually read, where you have a simple list of buildings and a bunch of check marks. We have meters for these services in these locations. Two points I want to make here. One, not every building has the right check marks. Two, not all the check marks represent a meter that is working for one reason or another. And we've heard a long list of things that can be problematic. So I won't go into that, but we're still in the phase where we're trying to figure out what do we have that's working? Why is it, not, excuse me, why is it not working? And how are we gonna fix all that? Next slide, please. <clears throat> so today, last month we met with our ESCO uh, to walk around the campus, did the full basement tour, looked at a bunch of our systems. We went to a desk and looked at the computer, our control system, is a Johnson control system we use called Metasys. Metasys is great for what it does. We don't have it for all the buildings. So we have a couple that are on this one, a couple that are on that one. So that's problematic in terms of consistency. We have uh, legacy software. So we have stuff that runs into problems with IT all the time. Uh, we do literally still use Windows XP for people who remember what that is. So we have a couple of issues like that where we have, are not keeping pace with some of the things we need. So we're working with a, an ESCO to try and assess exactly what we do have, what we can do to move forward and get some of the things that we've seen in the other slides from other folks in terms of being ready to move forward with this. After we walked around the campus, I took my original budget number and I just doubled it. It's probably gonna double again. 
<laughs> it's just realistically, as you take every step, you realize there are a lot more steps than I thought. So this first path, which looks pretty straightforward, is very complicated. There are a lot of details, a lot of barriers, a lot of nuances. You've got to include a ton of people and people that you didn't know you needed to talk to. So as was mentioned, you have a lot of complicating factors like, like we're mentioned. We'll just move on from there. <laughs> Next slide, please. A year from now, we hope to have all this stuff in. We start, hope to have some good data, at least preliminary data coming in so we can move forward with these next steps. And we're all gonna be in the same boat here. And I'm just gonna skip ahead to 2025. We need to be 100% accurate. We need to be getting good EUI data and we need to have target. So that's gonna be really challenging to meet in about a year and a half from where we are now. I believe it can be done. I'm hopeful that in the first year we can make all those milestones that, were, that I showed you on the previous slide. I'm hoping that we can make a lot of progress on what we need to a year from now and be incrementally ramping this up. My one saving grace is that for the first round of compliance, I only have four buildings. So I might be able to get that done. <laughs> Unfortunately, one of them is practically the oldest building on campus and it's super inefficient. And then uh, the other two were built uh, around 1970-ish and they have been upgraded in 1970 when they were installed. So we have some challenges there. Anyway. I'm sure that I'm preaching to acquire a lot of you have similar issues and I wanna save my time for the Q and A. Thank you very much. Great, thank you, David. Um, it's helpful to hear that kind of dose of realism that you shared with, you know, you didn't know where, you didn't know what you didn't know uh, when you started. Uh, you're kind of spitballing out some, some numbers and now you're getting a little further in the process and realizing, okay, this is this is bigger than I thought. Um, and uh, you know, but I I love hearing the optimism that hey, we're just we're taking this, we're we're going, we're on our way, and we're gonna make it happen, however we can. So um, I think that's the approach that uh, is is gonna get everyone there. So thank you for sharing that, and thanks uh, to all of our our uh, presenters so far, um, all of our presenters are gonna stick around for a Q&A discussion. I also wanna note that we also have Lincoln Ferris from um, Seattle Central College for joining us for the Q&A session. So Lincoln has, uh, a, a, again, a lot of experience with sub-metering. I think that um, that campus had their sub-metering in place before clean buildings. So, um, but still implementing implementation of that uh, program, very similar process and probably a lot of the same lessons learned that he can share. So we will just, I'm gonna stop sharing here. I do have a, a slide queued up with everyone's contact info. We'll look at it at the end, um, just so we can kind of see each other a little better here. And um, I've also wanted to know, uh, I forgot to mention, I do have Rebecca Shepard also from Smart Building Center along with Britton um, helping me out here. Rebecca is the one who runs our, our clean buildings uh, help desk. So Rebecca has a very valuable resource. Again, um, go to our website, smartbuildingcenter.org um, to access that resource. But let's go ahead and just open up some, some questions. I do have one question here um, from Nicole. Uh, and you touched on this a little bit, Pete, but um, for submetering, any recommendations for how to fully separate a building on a campus when there are shared energy uses? Um, in, for example, um, compressed air from a central location that's used at multiple buildings, outdoor lighting that's tied into lighting in or on the building being submetered, um, et cetera. So if anyone wants to give a a little more context on that, that'd be great. Uh, uh -huh. I'll jump in first. <clears throat> and I will say, I have not run into uh, shared compressed air systems that run across campus. I'm not saying that they don't exist. I just haven't had to deal with that yet. And that's something that uh, I, my recommendation would be to talk to um, commerce 
and how they interpret compressed air. And if, do they look at that as an energy source that needs to be monitored? Um, I have not run into that on any of the campuses that I've worked with. Uh, likely that compressor, I'm assuming, is in like a central utility plant or something like that. Um, they may, I don't know, they may allow not to account for it. I'm not sure. I just haven't run into that. I don't know, Andrew or David or even Lincoln, if that's something on your campuses you've run into. We have compressed air on tons of our buildings, but they don't go to, to multiple buildings. Um, so yeah, that's, that's an unusual one for us as well. As far as the uh, outdoor lighting, um, you could essentially get different points and submeter that, but that would be a pretty huge cost for probably not a lot of consumption. Would you agree with that, Pete? Because I, I would say, yeah, we have outdoor lighting uh, at all of our buildings, and some of them are like pole lighting or even further out from the buildings. But to submeter that, to subtract, do the math equation on that probably wouldn't be worth it. Yeah, I want to jump in too. We um, we also have not run into the situation with compressed air being uh, fed to multiple locations, and I agree that I'm not sure commerce would require that. Um, we are looking at some metering in some cases steam, and we are including that in reporting um, as an energy source, for sure. Uh, one thing I do want to want to mention, though, is that a big primary focus of clean buildings is for that every um, everything that is done and the money that is invested is invested in a cost effective way. And that is something that commerce is feeling really strongly about. Um, that has driven a lot of any of the small tweaks to guidance that they've rolled out. And so that is something that I think would play into this conversation about if it even makes sense to submeter the lighting, for example, um, or to, su to submeter something very small or very negligible. Um, there's a cost effective component to it as well. And they really want to make sure that most of the funding is going to an actual efficiency project, at least from what I have heard. So that's just something to consider when you're starting to think about the small little aspects of what could potentially be submetered. Right. You no, know, honestly, Thanks. I was thinking about this. I don't even know if, and I'd have to look at Energy Star. I don't think Portfolio Manager even handles um, compressed air. Uh, my guess so. is if you if you talk to Commerce, they would probably allow you to not even consider it, um, and hopefully that compress that it would have to be a very large compressor that's in your central utility plant feeding out to other buildings. Um, if it is multiple buildings, hopefully that's in your central utility plant that's relatively small, that doesn't have to go through any sort of compliance so you don't get penalized for that one compressor too. Yeah, good points all the way around. Um, kind of similar, on a similar note then, uh, I think I know the answer to this question. I'll let someone to take this though. Uh, can the submeter be automated to upload into uh, into um, portfolio manager? Uh, can it be updated to? Can it auto be automated to upload into one workbook, for example? I can take that real quick. Mm -hmm. um, so, yes, is the short answer. Uh, we currently are in process of having that be auto uploaded as an email into our email accounts on the first day of every month. And from there, the next step will, have, will be to have that data be automatically uploaded into Energy Star Portfolio Manager. The whole process we want to be is we want is completely hands off. So we haven't done it. We haven't come to completion on it yet. But yes, it is very possible. Great. Thank you. Go ahead, David. Yeah. Quick, quick follow up on that. Uh, I'd love to have a system that's as automated as possible, but I know that we've also run into issues that when they're automated, you don't pay as much attention and you can miss things. And as we've heard, there can be some spikes and variations and stuff you don't catch if you're not looking at it closely. I am not a fan of manual labor. I'm not saying that I wish I could data enter <laughs> everything, but I do think that you get an extra level of um, inspection, if you will. And so some of the things you could catch, such as that was mentioned earlier, um, you know, again, it always a trade-off. You're, you're absolutely right. So to counter that, um, we actually are in the process of adding auto notifications when a meter cuts out. So it'll just be, and SkySpark's awesome. I'm not trying to sell your product ATS, Pete, but um, SkySpark is awesome because you can add that as a custom feature. And so that's exactly what we're trying to do is make sure that if anything's out of place, we're notified on it immediately. 
So good point there, David. Excellent. Thank you. Good to have that information. Yeah, and that's a, that is a good point. I think it was alluded to earlier um, th that, you know, you need to have someone who's going to be keeping an eye out, whether you've got it automated or not. It's this is an ongoing process. Um, you can have all the data that you want. You can have all the data in the world. What value is it if A, nobody's looking at it? B, it's way too much to even handle because you don't have the resources to keep an eye on it or make sense of it. Um, so that gets back to Pete's point about, uh, you know, really thinking through what is the data you need, why, and who's going to manage that, who's going to be able to keep track of it. So um, great, good points. I've got another question here. Um, let's see. We've got a couple of, we've got some good questions coming in. So is the BAS system intelligent enough to take the energy consumption data as an input and control the MEP equipment for efficiency? I'm, I'm thinking of what MEP is. What's the- Mechanical uh, electrical plumbing. Okay. Thank you, yes. Uh, I'll, I'll jump on that. Uh, right. I would say the future, yes. The current, no. Um, and so I have, uh, there's a lot of things that are changing in the, the world of energy management, building automation systems. There is uh, AI systems that are being released. There's new products that are trying to take in this data and incorporate it. But in general, I have not seen it really successfully implemented. Now, there are some very basic things you can do if you have that meter data, not necessarily for efficiency, but for demand avoidance. Um, in fact, uh, the new code cycle, 2021 Washington State Energy Code, actually requires that there to be some demand limiting with, uh, within the buildings. Um, so they don't define it very well, but you can take that meter data and decide to, oh, um, you know, once we pass a certain point, maybe we disable the, I don't know, the second stage of heat on, on our, all our zones, or maybe we spread out all of our dead bands within the buildings to, to alleviate demand, or, or maybe we curtail our lighting. But as far as using that data for uh, making the current systems operate a little more efficiently, I just haven't really seen that um, deployed. Uh, I've heard people talk about it, but I haven't seen it deployed successfully, in, including our own company working with AI companies to try to to try to to leverage that. Yeah, I have not seen it done automatically either. Um, how we've really just had success with it was through our energy management program, where we we have an energy engineer that actively is leveraging that data to tweak building operations, and and that is successful. Um, and there are a lot of savings that you can get from that. But um, that does involve having someone actually, you know, actively involved uh, evaluating the data and keeping an eye on it. Again, yep. Okay, um, and some clarification on that question from Nicole about the uh, compressed air, just going back to that. Um, she says their bus bases must comply with Washington clean buildings and are considered vehicle maintenance building types. So. Commerce has said that they must include the compressed air energy usage because it's part of the main electricity meter, um, unless mm -hmm. they fully submeter the individual building on the campus and submeter the compressed air. Um, so they're likely going to pursue the investment criteria pathway for this and, and other reasons. So just an interesting note there. So that makes sense because it's part of the full building consumption that um, it's just going to be lumped in regardless. So that does make sense. And that might be, you know, that's a situation I would say where it's probably not cost effective to add that tiny submeter for the compressed air. So you either have to kind of eat that extra energy or as you're saying, go the investment criteria route. Um, that, that does track with the approach for a lot of buildings. I mean, buildings that have underground parking also have to report that energy unless they submeter it, even though mm -hmm. parking is not included for compliance. So that does make sense. Mm -hmm. Yeah, thank you. Um, one more question here, a little getting a little specific. Um, Pete, expand on how the CTs were so commonly incorrectly sized. Were these not sized by a qualified professional? Were typical CT sizing conventions found insufficient? 
um, very low vote, vote uh, low usages um, cited yeah. for an example. Okay. Yeah, and, and let me clarify. I, I don't want to say this is commonly commonly like oh my goodness, every third meter is, is or CT size incorrectly. This is just one of the more common issues that I see when there are problems. Um, and, and typically, what happens is, and, and this is a lot of times on new construction buildings because of the Washington State uh, Energy Code and all the different submeters you need to put on because you need to break out several different types of loads and mechanical loads being one of them. And a lot of times what will happen is they will have a, you know, shell and core maybe, they build a mechanical panel that size for I don't know, 100 amps or bigger, I don't, I don't know, pick a number. And if normally what happens, the engineer does not size the CTs. They say, hey, uh, the electrical designer or contractor, you were supposed to put in a, a, an electric meter of sorts. Sometimes it's in a roll to the panel or not. Um, and then they will, maybe they, the CTs that, are, that were selected were maybe just a little bit larger than they needed to. But the design of the system, um, once they actually did the TIs, they realized, oh my goodness, this load is a fraction of what they designed it for. And then when you go to a very low load condition, meaning it's nighttime and very few things are running, it's well below what the turndown ratio is for not the com and it's not just the CT. It's the combination of the CT and the meter. Not all, not all meters are exactly the same. Um, some have different accuracies and turndown rates and at low levels. So um, so the the best case scenario, I would say, is in the existing building, the built environment, you know what the loads are. It's not you're putting on a meter and something, well, in a year from now, two years from now, when the TI is done, we'll have a better sense of the loads. You should know what the loads are. So with the proper electrical professional, they'll be able to size it properly um, and then and select the proper meter for the range that you have in the building. Great, thank you. Um, I wonder if, if anyone can comment on the pros and cons of submetering a portion of a building such as a data center or EV charging. We've touched on that a little bit, but um, let's get into that a little, a little more. I'm happy to jump in on that one, especially data centers. You chose a very exciting particular space use type. Um, as I mentioned earlier, data centers don't have a target. The only way a data center can comply is the investment criteria path given that is a large enough portion of a building. So if you have a building that is part, like let's say 50-50, 50% data center, 50% classroom, and it's all large enough to be included in clean buildings compliance, um, you have two options. And that is that you just do invest, if you don't have the data center submeter, you do investment criteria for the entire building. So that means that audit for the whole building, um, life cycle cost analysis for the whole building, implement cost-effective measures for the whole building. But you do have another option of getting that data center and its large amount of energy consumption submetered and only doing investment criteria for that space. And then you can actually pursue standard compliance for the other space. There's, I, I would not say take this and run with this. This is why it's worth talking this out with someone because there's a lot of factors as far as gross floor area of these spaces and other factors that determine. But high level, you can take that other space and run with it by benchmarking it and just pursuing regular targeted compliance. So there's a lot of benefit to that. For EV charging, there's also some benefit because that's not its own space typically, but it is just an extra energy load. So you're really just bumping up your EUI when you don't need to. So depending on how much it increases your EUI, I would take that information to run an ROI on if it makes sense to submeter it. If you only have like one car charger, it might not be relevant, but if you plan to expand that and have a significant amount longer term, that's really gonna hit your EUI and you might want to consider submetering that. So very situation specific. Clean buildings is really interesting in that way. Everything else that we've been posed with before, like the Seattle building tune-up and benchmarking ordinances, they don't have any of this meat and potatoes like clean buildings. You don't have to meet a target. You don't really have to prove much. You really just have to demonstrate that you are um, tracking your energy consumption. And, and yes, I know there's a little bit of addition for the tune-up, but it, it's not the same level of intent as clean buildings where you have to do something to meet a target. So you wanna be as clear cut in most situations as you can be about what energy you're tracking and reporting. And if you don't have to track and report it, 
or include it in your EUI, you might not want to with submetering. Great, thank you. We have a couple more questions in the q and A. I'd love to, I, I do wanna give Beth Gilbertson um, from PSE a, a chance to introduce herself. And so if any of the panelists wanna take a look at those open questions and um, type a response to those, that'd be great. We can also follow up with you and um, maybe address those if, uh, if we still have some time. Um, I guess also what I wanna do is just give you all, I'm, I'm hearing some common themes throughout these presentations. One of those is start now, if you haven't already, get on it. Another one is there are resources available for you. Um, I'd like to just do a quick lightning round with everyone. What are like your top one or two takeaways um, from this whole process? Julia, you're at the top of my screen, so I'm going to start with you. Okay. Um, Absolutely, I want to like triple underscore that there are a lot of resources gearing up all around the state to assist with this because we understand that this is a big deal. We understand that this is unprecedented as far as what is being asked of buildings and the number of buildings that are being required to mobilize for this. So there are resources. Um, McKinstry is available, I have to say, you know, of course, we do enjoy working on this and but there's a lot of people available. There are a lot of resources like the Smart Building Center um, that can assist with these conversations and with this planning and with the projects that might have to be done long term. The other thing is that I really want everyone to think of the ways that this can be leveraged for any future planning, because what you're doing here, yes, it is for compliance, and there are a lot of drawbacks to that, but. I also know that a lot of people are trying to pursue decarbonization in the long term, um, and that's something that you want to share if you are a college campus. That's something that your your students care about. That's something that the future cares about. And so think about how you can take this and leverage this to meet your future goals and think about all those other aspects that can come with it um, and about all the funding that is currently being that is currently existing or being generated to support this out there, including the Inflation Reduction Act and many more. Great, yeah, thanks for making all those points. Any, anybody have anything else to quickly add to that? I'd like to give Beth a, a minute to talk. Yeah, two things. Um, I would say, uh, Pete said, you need a champion, RCM. You should, you should get an RCM. You should cost share an RCM if you're a smaller campus or a municipality, or if you're a bigger one, uh, hire a full-time RCM. Um, if you do that, you're going to be, you're going to have the champion get, get what you need to get done. Um, the second part is strongly consider contracting out. These people are professionals. They know what they're doing. They're dialed down and, and they know the clean building legislation very well. I would build on that and say, you need to make sure that it's clear to your leadership. That this is not a pet project. You need help. I can't just do this in my spare time. And there's a lot of help out there. So I, I would agree, make that point higher up. Can I just add that somebody Please. in the DT of administrative services role, uh, and that we are much further down the road, we are basically with a design eco district, you know, to come into compliance with 2311, the Greenhouse Gas Reduction Act. This is just a down payment, and it's a pretty small down payment compared to the real cost of when you start taking a look at solutions building by building or in a building district, much as Luck David has. Uh, you're talking in the, well, certainly in the tens of millions of dollars. You need to start preparing your board and or your decision makers. Where are you going to find the money? Over what period of time are you going to finance it? And then more importantly, you know, how much of this is a change in technology and how much of it is a change in behavior? One of the things uh, I was involved in when the Pacific Tower was being designed was submarine by tenant so that we could get actual behavior modification, if you will, within tenants of the, at how they use energy, how they use electricity within the building. So uh, there's a whole multiple layers that go into sort of trying to meet greenhouse gas reduction goals, which I think the Clean Buildings Act is just a piece of meeting those state goals. Great. Thank you. And we'll compile some of these takeaways um, for you all to have as a reference. Um, Beth, I did make you a panelist if you want to jump on and uh, say a few words. 
Yeah, thank you. Um, uh, so I'm Beth Gilbertson. I work with Puget Sound Energy with um, higher ed sectors, municipalities sector being um, businesses I support and hope to connect with and connect them to our incentive program, specifically the Clean Building Accelerator Training. Uh, if you all don't know what that is, I encourage you all to um, go on the PSC website and take a look. It's free training on how to come into compliance. It offers up a whole boatload of resources to help you get to where you need to be. Um, we also have other programs that will help assist you with compliance. Uh, one is the Commercial Strategic Energy Management Program, which incentivizes all of your energy savings and also provides you with an energy management engineer to help you with the lift of compliance and with also implementing a sustainable energy management program. So if you wanna know more, you can reach out to me. You can always reach out to Melissa. She knows how to get in touch with me and um, would, uh, be happy to discuss this in more detail. Thanks, Beth. And if you wouldn't mind just um, typing your email into the chat so folks have uh, All right. that contact directly, that'd be great. Okay. Um, I know we are at a little past the, the time we had allotted. So um, we could obviously continue this discussion for a, a lot longer and maybe we'll have to schedule some kind of a follow-up because this is, again, a very uh, ripe topic for discussion. And I just wanna thank again, all the panelists time. Um, thank you so much for your sharing your expertise. This is super valuable. We will send out the a link to the recording, the slides and some additional resources for you all, as well as contact information. So um, watch for that. And thanks again, watch for future offering from Smart Building Center. Have a wonderful afternoon, everyone. Thanks again. Thank you Thanks so everybody. much for having me. Thank Have you. Have a good afternoon, y'all. Thank you.